Friends, welcome to Bet On You Radio, where every week we have an amazing guest sharing inspirational stories to give you the tools and strategies you need to bet on yourself and win. I am Ben Whiting here with my colleague and dear friend, Angie Morgan Witkowski. Angie, how's your week been? It has been awesome. Do you know what makes my week so awesome? Tell me about it. Just meeting people. Meeting people. I love hearing people's story. If you're going to sit next to me on an airplane, you are not getting out of that experience until you tell me like a few things about your life. Because oh, I love that. Do you do that? Do you talk to people on airplanes? I'm the person that I'll put my AirPods in my ears, <laughs> even if I'm not listening to anything, so I don't have to talk to people. But I almost always take an early flight because they tend to be the ones that get canceled oh, the least. Oh, that's true. Which means I'm groggy and miserable so. <laughs> but you know coming home sometimes you get that afternoon flight or meeting people you know just in the airport lounge it's kind of fun to talk to people there did yeah. you hear a good story last week from a stranger oh gosh i wish i could say yes and have a spontaneous answer on the fly but i just love to hear about how people got to where they are today and it's always you know surprising it's funny because we're going to talk in a few minutes with our guest Lisa Max Bar Price and we just met at our sons were playing baseball together. This was T ball, so this is like ten years ago. I just struck up a conversation and it was just amazing how many intersections we had in life. You know, we both grew up in northern Michigan. We were you know, crosstown rivals in school and both writers. It's just always fun. I'm sure you've had those conversations yeah, before. It's really interesting because when you think about it, you know, all of our close friends at some point in time were strangers to us. So oh, interesting. you point. never know if that stranger across the room is going to be your next best friend until you talk to them, until you find out about their story. My best friend in the world uh, is a guy named Michael Gober. Uh, he, we met in middle school. We were at a dance together. I don't remember even how we ended up started talking, but he's been my best friend since then. And I've seen him probably every year since 1996. Oh, that is and really special. He still lives in Georgia. <laughs> Do you go there? Does he come up here? How does that work? A little bit work? of both. A little bit of both. What's so great now is, you know, keynoting, I travel so much that if I'm in Tennessee, South Carolina, Florida, I usually will make a stop in Atlanta and just spend some time with him. I heard this really great technique. I was reading about it, actually, that I thought was just awesome for reconnecting more frequently with our friends. Because sometimes you'll see somebody who you just adore, their names coming through on the caller ID, and you're like, oh, I don't have 45 minutes to commit to this conversation, but I really want to have this conversation. So you might send them to voicemail, text, and say, let me get back to you, and then time passes. But I heard this technique that you should really invest in the eight minute phone calls. So the way that this works is that I'll say, text you, you know, hey, Ben, you got eight minutes, would love to catch up. So suddenly we have a time limit. Ooh. So now you don't feel like, you know, you're going to see my name and you got to think 45 minutes, you just, you're time poor, right? But if we can, we can cover so much ground in eight minutes. And the research was showing too that for both parties, conversations tend to go on longer than both people would like. So now you're putting some parameters on that. Oh, that's great. Just, yeah, because we all have 10 minutes. And, you know, they say the number one driver of engagement, productivity, and happiness uh, in life is just having quality relationships. And the more quality relationships you have, the happier you tend to be. I saw that there was actually that Harvard longitudinal study about happiness, and mm -hmm. it was connections. What makes your life rich is connection. So if you're listening to this and say, oh, I haven't been in touch with you know people at these stages of my life, give them an eight minute request text. All you gotta do is eight minutes. You know, it's funny, we've talked about so many techniques and strategies like listening to birds for one minute can improve mental function for up to eight hours. Uh -huh. An eight minute phone call with a great friend you know, can improve the longevity of your life by maintaining those quality relationships. What's another like quick, uh, down and dirty, like biohack or life hack you have that you think has, or have found that has great results for you? Oh, I'm a huge believer in closing my day with gratitude. Ah. And so, you know, you we all go through stages of our day when we're happier or more frustrated than other days. But if I can close my day just reminding myself the three things that I'm most grateful for, it just has a way of resting my head at night so I'm not ruminating on things and it gives me restful sleep. What about you? Oh, for me, it's um, I always try to get 30 grams of protein in the first 30 minutes I wake up. Oh, okay. And I am not a breakfast person, but I know that if I put some fuel in my body, I just work at a better level, you know, function more. So what do for you me, do, like chia? Yeah, it's so it's it's uh, a little bit of oatmeal or oat bran. Okay, like usually the instant stuff, so it only takes a minute. A scoop of protein powder, two tablespoons of chia seeds. I stir it, and that's usually breakfast for me. That's the magic. That's it's, how the magic. Starts. It doesn't taste great, but you know what? <laughs> you know, being healthy never does. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, you're going to get all so many spokesperson 
opportunities out of that. <laughs> I know, right? But well, I'm actually really excited because our guest today is a person who writes about health and has probably tried every trend anyone listening has ever imagined. And she's uh, a dear friend of yours. She is. And you know, if you go on Instagram and follow Lisa Max Bar Price, you're just going to fall in love with her because she has such a zest for life. You can tell that she writes about nutrition. She writes about health and wellness and she lives it. And I think those are types of people that I love the most, right? That you believe them because they're out there doing it. She's such a wonderful storyteller, person to be around. So Lisa and I, we've got this really interesting history. We actually were in rival high schools together. So we graduated around the same time. We didn't really know each other. She went off and had this amazing, adventurous writing career. We both came back to Northern Michigan around the same time. Our sons were playing t-ball together. We got to meet Lisa. Do you remember that wonderful day when we connected on that baseball field? I do. Oh my gosh. I remember we had a discussion the length of the field as we were walking across the field and I thought this is someone I really want to get to know because when you just meet other people who have had interesting lives, have lived all over, you just want to meet them again for coffee. I and had we have? N- no idea you two were rivals initially. This oh, is, uh, we've come a long deal. way. Yes. We've come a long right. way. Mm-hmm. I think we played volleyball together because you were a volleyball That's player. Right. Mm-hmm. And so was I for Kalkaska High School. You were St. Francis High School. That's correct. It's a big rival. Did you right? actually play against each other? We must We must have, have overlapped. Yes. Oh my gosh. Wouldn't you love I to think... roll tape on that and see <laughs> that? <laughs> oh, if only we had our phone cameras. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Back then. So what the heck happened? What happened after high school? Tell us about your life. What did you do? (laughs) Oh, boy. Okay, so, yeah, I was growing up here in Traverse City, and my goal, because this is, of course, the cherry capital of the world, right? Mm -hmm. We have a big festival. Mm -hmm. My goal in life was to enter a scholarship pageant and become the cherry queen so that I could work as an ambassador for this area. And guess what? I lost. And that was like my first really big public failure, Ooh. right? You feel like you let your family down, your your friends, your corporate sponsor. So instead of having this built-in job working as an ambassador here in Michigan, I decided to move as far away from my hometown as possible. <laughs> Banished. Yeah. Banished. Was that and... like on a jet fuel with shame? <laughs> I just, you know, I was... I, my plan had blown up and now I needed a new plan. So I moved to New York City with very little money and even less of a plan. And that's where I just hit the pavement and started looking for a way to get my foot in the door in the publishing world. So in that, so I assume that's why you chose New York City, because it has such a, a, yes. a rich publishing you know, atmosphere. Exactly. Yes, I wanted to work in magazines. So I'm fascinated by that because, again, putting us back in time and not to age us, Lisa, but growing up in northern Michigan, which is a really, really small community, New York City must have felt so big. What did it feel like to step yes. foot into New York City and just being, again, small town girl? It was so invigorating. I mean, I couldn't I couldn't believe I was there. I was so thrilled. Um, I spent six months living on my sister's floor. She lived in the tri-state area, so I would take the train in every day and just cold call, you know, try try to get informational interviews, try to go on headhunter interviews. And it was rough, right? Like for three solid months, I didn't get a job. I remember my mom calling and saying, you know, you gave it a really good shot. Do you want to come home? Like, you're always welcome to come home. She was being supportive, but I... um, I told her, no, I want to give it a little bit more time. And luckily, I think I got a job like the very next day. And so that just reminds you like how close sometimes you are to a breakthrough when you quit. So I'm so glad I didn't quit because, gosh, 90% of the things I really value in my adult life, I... Uh, it all stemmed from starting my career in New York. That's incredible. You know, Angie, there's a story. Do you watch The Office like I do? Oh, like all the time. So, every yeah, other so, day over and over again for five years. Yeah. This reminds me of John Krasinski, his story, because he was doing the same thing in LA trying to become an actor. And he called his mom up and was like, mom, I'm done. I have no gas left in the tank. And his mom was like, just give it another month. And his next audition was for the office. And he get, obviously that changed the course of his life, but he was that close. Like if he hadn't called his mom and said, you know, I'm done, he might not have happened. 
Yeah. But that was just, it, it inspired me just the exact same way hearing your story, Lisa. <laughs> so I would, I, it was thrilling to be in New York, but it was, it was tough going. I remember going on an interview and the two interviewers at a fancy magazine were actively making fun of me the whole time. You know, like, <laughs> like they what? just, they just thought I was like such a country bumpkin. They kept thinking, or they, I, one of them told me, you should go on MTV real world. No one would believe you exist. You're like from this small farming community. I mean, that's but sort the of aspirations to be the cherry queen. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, I went to an all women's college. They just thought like I was this anomaly. And, um, you know, luckily I did get my foot in the door and start working. And I've happily been working in national media for 24 years. You know, my, my wife is obviously from Traverse City. She went to an all girls college in New York and her nickname there was Tractor Girl. Isn't that funny? It's just, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, but you know, you exist, obviously. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. So I was just, you know, as you were telling your story too, you think about that very first, you know, career opportunity and what it opened up to. So you're a published author, you get to write full time, you freelance, and now you're working for a major publication. I imagine you hear people all the time say, I want to do what you're doing. And we had a Bet on You radio guest not too long ago, John Bacon. He's a sports writer and all these mm-hmm. really cool things. And he reminded us that people want to do, what I'm doing now, but they don't necessarily want to do what I had to do to get here. So talk about that first job that you yes. had. <laughs> right. So my very first job in New York City was at a trade publication. So it wasn't Consumer Pub. It was trade. It was called Physicians Weekly. I was doing medical news, right? So I was going to medical conferences and stuff. Um, and to be able to live in Manhattan, I had to have side jobs. I I um, babysat and was a dock walker and, you know, apartment sat for people, anything I could do to make ends meet. But I was just thrilled to do all of it because, you know, I, I, I equate it to having like a base camp before climbing Everest. Like if you can just get to the base camp, that's part of the journey, right? Like that, that's a big first step. So just having that first job I knew was the beginning of something. So um, I just stayed really humble. I think... I think that Midwestern work ethic really took me far. I mean, my dad is a really hard worker, and I just, I think um, after that first step, I just was able to prove myself and slowly climb that ladder. I imagine, too, I didn't, I don't think you had a medical background in undergrad, so that must have been eye-opening, too, to write on something that you're like, oh, back to college. Right, exactly. But the thing I love the most about writing is that you're paid to just research things you're curious about, right? So I had all day, every day, and my job was just to learn more about this topic that I'd been given, right? Whatever assignment it was. And what a privilege to be able to call the world expert on whatever that topic is and have them explain it to you. Do you you remember a specific topic from that time that you were just like, oh, how cool is this? Oh, gosh. Um, I remember there was a small plane crash in a hospital in Chicago, and they flew me out there. I was the first journalist to kind of cover the story. And a lot of what they figured out there for emergency management ended up becoming sort of canon for for hospitals around the world. And and I think just t- even, you know, 9-11 happened after that. Like, people were using some of that um, – rescue information and evacuation protocol uh, in the, into the future. So I remember doing that story and feeling like this is really important. This is interesting. Lisa, you said something a few moments ago that really kind of uh, perked my curiosity. You said you always tried to stay humble even as you were kind of hustling through New York. And I think that's a difficult line to walk sometimes when you're trying to promote yourself and you're trying to seem competent, but you're also trying to stay humble. How do you walk that line? Oh, gosh. Um I don't know. Like, I, I just think I was so incredibly grateful for every mm. opportunity. I mean, they really let writers do anything in the name of a good story. Mm-hmm. So I think I was like three months on the job, and they said, go to the U.S. Open. You're going to be on a practice court volleying with Billie Jean King and talking to her about Are you women's- serious? <laughs> yes. You did this? Yeah, this is a true story. I mean, tell, tell us yeah, the story. So, um, it, the, the story was about cardiovascular health and, and educating women about about their health. And so, yeah, they had all these journalists come out and meet Billie Jean King and Virginia Wade and all of these legends of the tennis sport, right? That's and so cool. we ended up like practicing and playing a little bit of tennis. I am a terrible tennis player, but I can say I have played a little tennis with Billie Jean King. Did you win? <laughs> <laughs> 
I so it's just amazing, right? Be, being grateful for all of those moments. I actually write about her in Bet on You um, about her mindset over envisioning failure on the court. Like she used to not just envisioning envision success, but really envision what would happen if a mistake was played and how she would respond to that mistake so it wouldn't let her face. So again, we talk about thinking about all the great things that will happen to you. She's like, well, let me think about the bad things and how I'm going to respond to it. That She's is... probably thinking that when you're lining up against, <laughs> oh, <laughs> this ringer. <laughs> that is so fascinating. My mentor said you really want to watch how people react when things go badly, not when it goes well. So, right, like, how are you going to bounce back in that moment when everyone's watching you and you really just want to throw a pity party, right? Instead, it's just like, all right, what's my next move? Don't dwell on, the, on what, what went wrong, but just keep, keep moving forward. Who was your mentor? Oh, uh, my, my editor, Carol Brooks. Oh, that's great. How did you find a mentor? Um, well, I was working for her at First for Women magazine, and um, she just – she just is great at developing talent and really trying to figure out what your strengths are and rather than just hiring someone for a particular job like just hire good people and figure out how they fit into the organization so i've had so many jobs under her you know social media editor and uh, true storyteller uh, i i was um you know i was editing a third of the magazine at one point for her so she she's taught me a lot of different things oh, so that's fantastic I want to hear, too, about the moment that you realized that this was not just, not that it was ever to be a hobby, right? You were, it was obviously your first job, if you will, out of college. But when did you realize that you were a journalist? That sounds so professional and buttoned up, but was it a realization? Or did you just say, you know what, I'm going to be a journalist, I'm getting paid to write, therefore I am a journalist? You know, it's interesting. Um, it's sort of a surprising path for me because I was one of those kids who really struggled to learn to read. So my mom was a big advocate, getting me tutors and probably dramatically changing the course of my life. Um, so I have dyslexic tendencies. I mean, you never would have thought I would have ended up being an editor in New York. But um, I think maybe the first sign that I could do writing was in eighth grade when I won an essay contest. Sometimes you just need to hear things from other people for you to believe it yourself. So I guess that's the power of compliments, right? Mm -hmm. Like somebody said, oh, you're a good writer, like like stick with it. And then I started really believing it. So in college, I was an editor at um, the, the school newspaper at Notre Dame. And I, I've always been an underdog, right? Like everybody who was working there um, had been the editor in chief of their high school newspaper. My high school hadn't even had a newspaper. So I was just really learning on the job. But I think just as soon as you start making money writing, you're you're a journalist, you're a writer, right? You you can't you can't go out and be a surgeon just off the bat, but as soon as you start writing, you are a writer. So I mean that that's validating in and of itself. You say more often than not you're you feel like the underdog. What like practical advice would you have for someone who's listening to this that might feel like the underdog in any venture they're pursuing? Oh my gosh. I think we hear a lot about the pristine habits of successful people, right? They all wake up early. They all finish a big workout before the sun gets up. And I think that makes a lot of us feel like that's not a life we can achieve. And I just like to practice this sort of messy momentum, right? Like our lives are messy. I'm, I'm someone who's anxious and I self-sabotage with procrastination sometimes and I have autoimmune condition that slows me down at times I've got all these things that kind of get in the way but nothing is stopping me from putting one foot in front of the other like you can still have momentum and forward progress so my advice is like not to to view your competition as these other people with these amazingly tidy rituals and instead just realize your competition is just the person you were yesterday. Like you really okay. are just trying to move the ball forward and become better than you were yesterday. And in that way, we can all slowly move toward our dreams, right? Like I'm kind of a nut like that. I'm, I'm, I, I'm tired and want to nap and stuff, but I can still do something each day that moves me closer. That's fantastic. Angie, you've said this. In the, I love messy momentum. That's something I'm going to be quotable. thinking about a lot. But you've said something in the past, very similar, Angie, that I always like that, you know, the goal is not perfection at the finish line. The goal is just to be a little better tomorrow. And that's something I always try to keep in mind, especially when I'm feeling anxious or feeling 
you know, you feel when you start comparing yourself to other people, imposter syndrome creeps in. And so I think that's that's absolutely fantastic advice. Messy momentum and just be a little bit better oh, tomorrow. I know. I had a great mentor in the Marine Corps who saw that I was super competitive. Like I was the type of person if you sat next to me and were tying your shoe, it was a race. <laughs> like game on. <laughs> like I'm gonna do this fast. I know the type. <laughs> and, and he reminded me, he's like, I can tell you're really competitive and you're going into a really competitive space in the Marine Corps and that attitude is gonna crush you be better than yourself. That's a race you can win every single day. Stop looking over your shoulder. And it was game changing for me to start thinking about that real. I'd love to hear from you though, this messy momentum. Is that something you branded? Is it something that you read? Is it a philosophy? I guess I just came up with it. Maybe someone has coined it, but... Um, you should trademark that. But trademark. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, right here. Um, my book is an alphabet book, so it was easy to think about it just one chunk at a time, one letter at a time as I was working on it. I, I made this... I had this big blank wall in my basement and I put a post-it note in order of every alphabet letter and slowly the wall filled in as I slow, you know, worked on it. And, um, and it was easy to see that this was a big project that I could just bite off in really small chunks. I, at the age of 38 uh, adult, was diagnosed with ADHD. And a lot of people don't realize that it's not an inability to focus. It's just you focus so hard. It's like you have the engine of a Ferrari, but your brain has the brakes of a tricycle, if at all. And so it's actually, you get so focused on one thing that you just start neglecting, you know, you forget to eat, you forget to pick up, wash the dishes, et cetera. This messy momentum you have, like what are habits that you have given yourself within that, that you have found or believe have led to your success? Sure. Um, well, often you'll like hit a wall, right? Writer's block. You just don't know how to proceed. And you can spend a lot of time just spinning your wheels. And so instead, I try to recognize that as soon as possible and think, okay, if I can't move this forward, what else on my to-do list can I do? What, you know, you just have to shift your attention to something so that at the end of the day, you feel productive about whatever, whatever that, that time slot, right? People talk about the is it the Pomodoro method where yes. they set like a little timer and you just try to work for 20 minutes on something, moving the ball forward. Um, and I'm a big believer in taking micro naps. I take a 22 minute nap. I set Alexa, the timer, and I just take at least one nap af every afternoon to reset. Um, I also take my shower in the middle of the day, which is weird because it's just a good way to sort of once I'm fully awake to have um, my brain, like the creativity is really flowing, right? It's, I, I've seen all the problems that have been presented for the morning. And then on my lunch hour, I, cause I work from home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then I, so I, I play around with my schedule in, in a weird way and just make sure that I can be productive when yeah, so the, the, the Pomodoro starts. method, showers in the middle of the day, what, 22 minute nap. That's a very specific time. It is, yes. I don't know. Just um, you know, it feels a little mil a little more luxurious than, than 20. a twenty minute. Yeah, <laughs> I take fifteen I minute it. naps, and it just transports me, and it's amazing exactly. what that can do. I know you can't. You're like a two hour napper. Yeah, if if I fall asleep, I'm gone for You're like gone. a REM cycle. <laughs> Did you ever hear of Dan Pink has this concept called the Nappuccino, and what he does? Love it. Yes, he takes an espresso shot sleeps for like 15, 20 minutes. And then when he wakes up, he's ready, really ready to go because that's when the caffeine kicks in and he's awake. The that is a nappuccino. What a brilliant idea that I will try this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back to you because you've been, you've had a home office for Since ever. 08. 08. So you were like the virtual working woman queen when the pandemic hit. Yes. Talk about, well, first off, talk about what it is that you do today and how, you know, with the pandemic and your life rituals, how those were impacted. Yeah, so I, I'm, I was able to bring my job from New York City, so I'm still a full-time writer. I uh, write for First for Women and Women's World, and those are some of the best-selling women's magazines uh, in the nation. So I, I mostly do health and nutrition, but sometimes I do celebrity coverage, and, and I also interview a lot of everyday people, just, just like this podcast, right? Ordinary, extraordinary people who have overcome like a health issue and, and share how they did it. So, wow, that's in 
incredible though, just to think about all the different types of people that you've been in contact with. You want to share an interview that you thought was standout and amazing? I'm sure you've had hundreds, oh my gosh. if not thousands, but I'd love to hear some I'm of the so, I, I'm so moved by people's stories. I mean, it's one of my favorite things, even in my leisure time, just listening to podcasts or like the moth, right? Of just mm-hmm. people's true stories. I'm trying to think of one that stands out. Well, I mean, I did recently interview this average mom. She had five boys, really busy, um, a, a, you know, just raising five busy boys and all the things that involve that involves. And, you know, all five of her sons ended up growing up to be professional athletes. One of them is Rob Gronkowski. Wow. <laughs> for, for, for Ben, that's a football player. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yes I, <laughs> yes. I have a theater degree, so I'm just looking at Angie like, help me. Give it, help I me know, out. I know. I'm supposed to know the same. Yes. But Mama Grock, and that story went crazy. Like, it was published in your current publication, and it got on Yahoo. Yes, exactly. Yahoo News picked it up, so that was great timing right around the Super Bowl. Wow, that's a fantastic. And so just kind of along those, so you 2008 was when you transitioned to be more freelance, and you're also a mom of amazing boys, and your house was probably loud and crazy during the pandemic. How were you able to keep it together? It was. So I have three sons, and we, we got a, a COVID puppy. So, you know, it was a busy household. What's the puppy's name? Winnie. Oh, that's a good name. What kind of yes. dog? A mini golden doodle. Oh, adorable. She's very sweet, but she barks. So sometimes I'll be doing interviews with these top experts and there'll be a barking dog in the background. But <laughs> but yeah, during the pandemic, it would be me on the phone interviewing a doctor for a nutrition cover story. And then all of a sudden I'd hear my son playing his saxophone and oh, it's it's music time because, you know, the kids who were... Uh, you know, they were doing the online learning or whatever. Yeah. They had to follow a certain schedule for their for their classes. That so with you know, now you've said you've had a home office since two thousand eight. You've obviously with your messy momentum have the self discipline to work. But in terms of work life balance, where do you um, how do you find ways to prioritize that and make sure that? Because I know personally for me during lockdown. Having my office like walking distance away, it was a temptation to always go in there and I could work until late in the evening. How do you keep that boundary there? I mean, it's a messy pound- boundary, <laughs> right? So I often, I do have an office, but I often do all my work on the dining room table. So that means I have to clear it to have dinner, right? That's a, a, a chore in, a, in and of itself. But um, I don't know. I guess I tried... I try not to work on the weekends if I don't have a deadline. I just really try to focus on family time on the weekends. Mm -hmm. How does that work? So again, I think a lot of our listeners think I want to be a writer one day or listen to your story thinking about how you've you know, turned this into a profession. How does it work when you work for a magazine? Do they give you stories? Are you finding stories? Like, what does that look like? So luckily, when I was in New York City for 10 years, I was able to build a lot of contacts. So that helped me transition back to being home in Traverse City, Michigan. But um, yeah, for many of those years, I was just freelancing, pitching stories to to editors. And and once they knew me, then um, they would just do direct, directly assign me the story so I didn't have to waste time pitching. But um, yeah, I'll get a story topic and I'm constantly working at maybe three different stories at once maybe a first draft of one a second draft of the other and so you know they're always in different stages of of completion but yeah it's a bit of a juggling act you know just you know is today a research day is today a day that we're interviewing experts or is today really just a writing day how has researching nutrition impacted you personally because I can imagine all the trends I saw on social media that you did the prolone yes <laughs> challenge yes, so too. I'm a I, that I, yeah. I try everything I mean <laughs> I am such I am so into biohacking like I you know the water I'm drinking right now has electrolytes in it right I I do the mushroom coffee I do I try everything and I love it. Now Lisa you've done you said you try every health trend because you have to write about it it's research for you I just for our listeners what are like two or three trends that you were like, ooh, this was a game changer, or one that you were like, don't waste your time on this? Oh, gosh. Um, I am really into lymphatic, like the lymphatic system, lymphatic flushing. So I will jump on a mini trampoline during the day to really make sure like the fluid in my body is is not stagnant, you know, keep, keep, keep me alert. 
Um, it's How many really, minutes do you have to jump? Oh, on I'll many, just jump for like one minute. You know, you pick your favorite song and it's like the best thing you can do right when you wake up in the morning when your body's all just been, you know, groggy stuck. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I didn't even know this term. Lymphatic I, flushing. Yeah, I know about the limbic brain, but I don't know about yeah. like. Okay. I think so, it's a lymph nodes though, not like the limp, limbic system. Yeah. Like yeah. Oh, yeah. So it, it's, um, it is the lymph system and it's like, you know, people are getting really into it with jade rollers and like, I saw you know, mind. anything you can do to sort of stimulate the system that lies underneath your skin. Okay. And jumping on a trampoline is great for that. Yeah, right? All right. What else have you tried? We're curious now. Oh, gosh. Uh-huh. I've tried cold showering. That is not for me, but I know a lot of people who do it. That is a huge thing it's right really now. It's really huge. Yeah. Cool ice baths. My son has been doing a cold shower for during Lent, and... I'm worried that he's not in the shower. Wait, he gave up hot water for lint? He did. And I'm worried that he also may have given up soap, too, because I wouldn't want to stay in there and like if it's a hot shower. Yeah, because if he doesn't stick with that habit, he's going to start smelling. Absolutely. That's, that is a growing concern with a 17-year-old son. But So you tried the cold showers. Yeah, I, not, um, for you. not for me. I'm always cold, so that doesn't help. But... Um, I do like the other side of it, the the heat treatment, right? Like mm-hmm. the saunas, the red light therapy, all that stuff is really mm-hmm. great. I love all the wearables, right? The ones that can tell us constantly what our stress level is based on, you know, heart rate variability and just all of those different, all that biofeedback stuff mm-hmm. I think is really fascinating. Like we used to go to the doctor once a year and now we can just get that kind of information around the clock and, and use it to feel better. What's, what's a trend that you are, that our listeners should not waste their time with in your opinion? Oh no. Um, gosh. I'll let Ben answer. Do you have a trend that our listeners that you've tried that people should never do before or never do ever? Oh, that they should never do ever. Um, I know I diets just in general, like keto diet, that kind of stuff. It doesn't work for me. I have to find a way to just eat healthy in general, because anytime I deprive myself of any macronutrient, I go insane and then I binge on it. Uh, but that's just me. <laughs> no, I call that like the absolutism. I hate absolutes. Like get rid of all these things. I'm like, well, maybe get rid of 75% of those things. I so I hate diets where it's like you can't ever. It's like, nah, yeah, you don't have to go crazy here. Eat vegetables and you know cut back on processed foods. That's yeah, the big funny. thing for yes. me. Right? Common sense, right? right? I will say the one thing, especially for women, we're not getting enough protein before noon. So if you can do one thing, just aim for 25 grams of protein. Before Equi. lunch, yes, equi. equi bread. You yes, know about of course. Equi? Yes. Monica Batia, yes. she was here and was you know get ten grams in one slice of bread. I know it's amazing. You're right. The yeah. protein. Three pieces of toast and you got thirty grams before noon. <laughs> Sign me <laughs> up. Three pieces. Of, <laughs> three pieces of toast and five. Like, do you live on a farm? <laughs> I do. <did. laughs> I just have oatmeal, protein powder, chia seeds. That's that's my breakfast every day because I'm uh, not a breakfast person. <laughs> okay, so Lisa, you are a children's book author. How many yes. people have told you that they wanted to be a children? children's book author how do you do it oh I mean everyone everybody's got a story in them right they do don't they right I do think a lot of people just ruminate about it and don't act so it's like if you really want to make it happen start writing that book and shopping it around and 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 having test readers and start seeing that come to fruition so talk about the process for you though because it you know again you can start writing it down you can start but there's also the industry side of it too so if you could just maybe think about like where were you, where did you get the idea where did you get the inspiration and what did the work look like exactly so I at this point in my career I had left New York and I was just working from home so you're kind of out of that vibe of having direct mentorship and um, I was no longer on a a, a, a certain track, right? Right. The track is, you know, as a writer, you're, you're writing captions and then sidebars and, and then bigger and bigger and bigger stories. So I wanted to do a book so that I had a project that was mine from beginning to end, right? I could own the entire project. And, um, and then, of course, I have three kids and, and I'm a nutrition writer. I couldn't find a book that that I liked for them. So I decided I had to write it myself. So I went around to 52 farms in the area and um, made this beautiful photography book about different foods that hopefully that kids could feel excited and brave enough to try things maybe that that they hadn't been introduced to before. And so you did all the photography. I did. I actually remember sitting 
at a coffee shop on a date night with my husband saying, I think I'm really going to do this food book. And the first thing I have to do is teach myself photography. (laughs) So, I mean, it was like that insane to be like, I'm going to do this and I don't, you know, have, right? I had to learn as I go. Again, another example of being an underdog, just kind of trial by fire, right? You figure out the next thing you have to do and you train yourself and then take the next step and the next step. I think like people, when they talk about change too, I'd love Ben for you to comment on this. It's more of a comment than a question. I think it's often talk about change. It's like we make these decisions that we are just going to do this. We're going to cross that line that we do in the sand and we're going to hit go. Just when they just make the decision that enough, like it's been brewing on my mind long enough, I just need to do it. I know talking with your work too, it's like you try to spark a lot of change in people. What do you think are some of the drivers for change for people? Drivers, when people want change, I mean, you have to realize people will have to want to change intrinsically. If they're mm-hmm. not, you know, if they don't want to, it's it's not going to happen. So you have to focus on the things that you can control to set other people up for success. Uh, and you learn that through experience. You learn that, hey, if I, you know, for me personally, if I deliver a keynote and I don't say this, I notice the whole section doesn't resonate. So when I talk about marbles, as I did with our interview, or talking about, uh, you know, communicating and positive uh, reinforcement and feedback, uh, yeah, so just focusing on the things you can control, uh, for me at least. And like for Lisa, right? The thing you could exactly. control is I can go become a photographer or at least right. be good enough to make a children's book out of this, right? Right, yeah. right. If, if you could go back in time to that person who has the idea for this book, what writing advice would you give them? Oh, gosh. Because I know we have probably have a lot of listeners who have an idea. Who's yeah. Like, you know, I should write that book. Absolutely. What advice would you have given to yourself? Well, I... I think don't give in to imposter syndrome, right? I mean, you, uh, I, I could think, of course, people know more about writing than I do. People know more about photography or book marketing, but no one knows more about this book that I invented in my mind than me. I'm the world expert on this thought that I had, right? So I think there's a lot of, I don't know, um, a lot of empowerment and knowing that you could, this idea that you came up with, you, you own it and, and you can get outside advice from people, but, but you don't have to be, you don't have to have permission for your own ideas, right? That's great. I know a lot of people and myself included, I'll include myself in this. I own 17 books on minimalism. You can sometimes (laughs) procrastinate by researching, but there's always more to learn. So it ends up actually just being, you know, a security blanket for your imposter syndrome. Oh, absolutely. That's why like in in bet on you and I learned it from the Marine Corps. We talk about the one ter- one thirds, two thirds rule. Spend one third of your time planning and two thirds of your time executing. And I think a lot of people get that backwards. Like I'm going to spend all my time in research and not spend any time into the effort of action. And then you miss the opportunity to learn like, oh, I need to do this different. I need to go back in this chapter because I didn't apply what I now know then. And so it's really iterative. I think people, again, see you with a book and it's like, oh, that looks fun. She can do it. I can do it. And yeah, you can. And then the process, though, is kind of messy. And it's not straight line. Right. And and definitely surround yourself with talented people. I mean, I had a great graphic designer. I had wonderful people test reading my book and giving me feedback. You don't just want your friends to read your book. You want people who are going to give you real criticism. So um, yeah, surround yourself with the best people. You're now here where Ben and I get to ask you our five favorite questions. And the first one, this should be the softball question for you. Because you are a journalist, you are a writer. My guess is that you're a reader too. Do you have a book that you read that just was really influential and or inspirational to you? Can you talk about it? Yes, absolutely. I always like to recommend First We Make the Beast Beautiful by Sarah Wilson. She's a magazine journalist down in Australia. And it's part, it's one part memoir, one part deep dive into brain science, and one part actionable tips for anxiety and this book is so amazing because it's really about taking those things that you don't love about yourself and finding and turning them into a strength right finding them as your secret superpower and applying that to my own life I have dyslexia so I mean that could have really held me back but instead I view it as this weird superpower because the fact that I'm a very slow careful reader has actually served me very well in the New York publishing world because I'm able to maybe catch mistakes that these brilliant speed readers might miss. Oh that's great when did you find this book? 
probably about three years ago. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I would say that I, you could edit my stuff any time of the day because I am not a good editor. But having that slow, careful, conscientious eye, perfect. Oh, man. So you told the story when we first started talking about when you were trying to become the Cherry Queen. Oh, right. It right. didn't happen. If you could go back in time to that girl right after she lost, what would you tell her? You know, I think about this a lot because it is so amazing that the thing I really wanted to do back then was be an ambassador for this area. And guess what I get to do with my book? I get to go around, talk about the agricultural area, and um, and basically I'm an ambassador for this this region about food. So I really am doing the job I wanted when I was 20. Um, so there really aren't, dreams don't have these expiration dates. There's just, de- it was just deferred, right? It was, I had to wait 25 years and now it means more to me to have this job because my three kids get to witness it. Oh, dreams don't good. have an expiration date. That's like really that. good. And I think about that too, back in the, back in the day, you had no way of envisioning how this dream was going to manifest either. It just wasn't the time. Exactly. And think about the journey that got you here. That's really powerful. Yeah, that's quotable. We've got oh, yeah. all sorts of quotes today. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Did you ever receive a piece of feedback that was really difficult to hear and helped you out tremendously? Sure. I mean, I did have an editor tell me she she thought I needed to drink more <laughs> because, <laughs> because I was a little stiff with my writing. She wanted me to relax and just kind of get in the flow. Keep in mind, listeners, this is we are not medical professionals. <laughs> this is not medical advice. <laughs> um, how did you take that? And how did you interpret it? Because right. again, feedback is a gift. Right, and there is exactly. a me- message in the method, maybe not the... Exactly. I think I think we can get a little rigid, right? We get stuck in ruts, especially in a creative field. You kind of get stuck doing things the same way. Um, so now, now what I try to do is if I'm struggling with maybe an opening scene of an article, ju- just write it wrong, right? The only way you're going to get to it being the right way is writing it wrong every other way, right? So try different things. You know, even if it's even if I write a scene and I'm like really proud of it, I think, okay, how could I write that completely different? And just to make sure it's kind of like a fact check, right? Just to make Mm -hmm. sure you're um, thinking, thinking about it in different creative ways. So so, yeah, just be a little loose with your writing. You don't have to be so rigid. Write it wrong. Man, you were just dropping dropping Drop quotes it. all day long you know, gold though, from the skies <laughs> it is i always think it's the second sentence that's my form of writing it's like it's never the first sentence that's going to be the gold it's always the second sentence nice. the first sentence just gets me in the water the second sentence is where the money is that's, oh, that's what funny. i always Excellent. think too okay. so yeah but it gets me started like i gotta start somewhere we, you talked a little bit about writer's block i'm going to take this uh, kind of a one step larger when you just get in a funk like we all get in them from time to time whether it's professionally personally what have you when you find yourself in a funk and you're aware of it, how do you get yourself out of it? Yeah, I mean, I do some of the things I've mentioned, like I jump on that trampoline or I take a hot shower and just really let my brain kind of untangle it, right? Um, I don't know. Just You just got to pivot. You go, go unload the dishwasher. Go do something else. Use a different part of your brain, and sometimes that problem will solve itself, right? The answer will find you. Just do something. Yes, exactly. Get get moving. Yeah, that's actually a method they have for ADHD because some people who have it struggle with task initiation. Mm-hmm. And they say a little way to kind of biohack that is just to move around, start doing something, anything. And eventually you can kind of carry that momentum into the task you want to do. I love that. So again, I think we have all these self-management tips. If we allow ourselves to be open to it and then use them, right? We know right. so much. How do we use the knowledge that we're acquiring? Last question, uh, Lisa. You know, if if you could, please give our listeners just some wisdom that you've acquired on life's journey, whether it's in writing or betting on yourself or taking a risk. Yeah, what what would you like to impart? I'm a very frugal person, but I kind of did a, a big splurge last year, and I hired a life coach for six months, and she really helped me a lot. And you know. She helped me realize that it's because I sometimes I think, oh, I was so brave when I was 20, right? I moved to New York City. Would I ever like do a big swing like that again? And 
And she reminded me, we are all of our old ages, right? All of our former ages at once. So I'm still maybe that timid 12-year-old, but that brave 20-year-old and that tired 35-year-old and, and you know, like the, the multitasking 46-year-old. So we, we can recapture any, any of our former selves, right? If we were brave before, we can do it again. And I don't know, I guess the message is just, being brave isn't something just for the young. I love that idea. That's. I mean, I don't know how we end on anything other than that. Other than. Other than. Asking people, you know, if they want to learn about Squash Boom Beat and where to get it, where can people find out more about you? Right. Hold it up. Yeah. Sure. sure. Um, so I, I'm on, I'm on, you know, all the social media apps and stuff. I, you can find me at squashboombeat.com. You can buy my book here in town at Horizon Books. And um, I'm on Amazon. And yeah, I'm like on Instagram and everything at, at Lisa Maxbauer. And the cool thing, too, is the next time you're at the grocery store and you turn to your left or turn to your right, you're going to see a magazine there and you can pick it up. And what are the magazines again? Right. Um, First for Women and Women's World. And you'll be able to thumb through the magazine, maybe buy it, of course. That's kind of what they want you to do. Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> buy it and find your find your writing in there. And now you know somebody, which is really cool. Thank you so much, Lisa, oh, thank for you. this time today. This is awesome. Lisa is such a great storyteller and a one-line deliverer. Oh my gosh, I have so <laughs> many notes, look at here our notes here from things that, I don't know if you guys realize this, but we're actually taking notes and usually passing notes when we do these interviews. But I have so much great stuff from Lisa and I just loved the phrase, messy momentum. Productivity, you know, achievement, it doesn't have to be perfect. You know, we don't have to compare ourselves to the people who get up at 5 a.m. and do their early workouts and have their fruits and vegetables before 7 a.m. You know, we can be messy. We can sleep in and still get things done. And I think the grace and like self-forgiveness that Lisa exuded and kind of told us about was just a phenomenal thing to remember. But what about you? Yeah, I love that because I think, again, like your success and your path to it is yours. Own it. And there are certainly habits because you hear about habits all the time and hacks and life is imperfect. So embrace those imperfections. You know, she said something earlier about the power of compliments. And I thought about that. You know, we say things all the time to people and how conscious and intentional are we about letting people know their strengths and skills you know my my niece goes to school here at northern michigan and i saw her over the weekend and i'm like did i give her compliments because she's at that formative age in life where she may not have the self-awareness to know what her really great skills are so i'm taking that away like i need to be more deliberate with helping people see the greatness and goodness that I see within them. Well, you know, when we talk to organizations, we always talk about the importance of positive feedback mm -hmm. because the, they have to be balanced, positive and negative. And what a lot of people don't realize is the balance is four to one. So if we want someone to listen and consider a piece of negative feedback we give them or constructive criticism without being defensive or trying to place blame, that person on average needs to receive four pieces of positive feedback for every one piece of negative feedback. And Harvard Business Review did a study on like the top 5% of performing teams in the mm -hmm. nation. And for those teams, the ratio was actually eight to one. So compliment cultures. And it's just so uh, imperative when you want to motivate someone to make sure you give them that positive feedback. Exactly. Make the investment in the bank because eventually you will have to give somebody tough, but you want to have that investment. And for those of you who are like, okay, four to one or eight to one, whatever, reminder, it is on average. It's not one conversation. It's not Beth. Right. Then you're great here. You're great here. You're great here. You're awesome here, but you suck. Yeah, here. <laughs> exactly. And you know, they, you know, they did the research on the, the constructive criticism sandwich and realized that it tastes awful because <laughs> Whenever you give someone positive feedback and negative feedback at the same time, they only focus on the negative. So yeah. keeping those separate is a good thing. For those of you, you know, they say something nice, sneak some criticism in, then say something nice, that sandwich. No, no. Terrible tasting sandwich. What else did yeah. you pick up from Lisa? I love what she said about to get started, write it wrong. Don't try to be perfect coming out of the gate. And she talked about this in terms of writing, but I think about it in terms of so many things. Mm -hmm. Just get something done. And what's really fascinating to me is... This really parallels with a metaphor that Rich Brower, one of our previous guests, gave us that when you're filming something, you have to go out of focus before you can get in focus. And she says you have to write it wrong before you can write it right. And so I think a lot of people are just, I know myself included, 
we're really hard on ourselves. We want it to be perfect out of the gate, but it's actually a lot easier if we just go ahead and assume we're going to be wrong out of the gate and then we're going to fix it. I assume I'm wrong when I start anything. Right. All <laughs> the time. Well, friends, you're so just excited to have Lisa here. Hopefully you picked up some really great tips that can help you in whatever bet on you journey that you're on, whether it is you aspire to be a writer, a children's book author, whatever it is, please just take some of these little nuggets of gold, apply them to your life. We'll see you next time on Bet On You Radio. Thanks, Alex.